we're excited uh, to present this uh, opportunity to you today. I uh, hope you learn a lot. Uh, there'll be a project website that you can check up on anytime you like to see how much progress we're making. Um, Dan Lawson, as Grant said, I'm the director of the National Center uh, for Interstate Compacts at the Council of State Governments. CSG is a membership organization for states. Every state's a member, every state pays dues. We were founded in 1933 at the University of Chicago. We've always worked on uh, interstate compacts since our founding. Um, it's one of the niche areas uh, for state governments and we're one of the few organizations and frankly, the only organization that has any expertise in this area. Um, this is possible from a department of the, uh, to a, from a cooperative agreement with the Department of, the De of Defense that we've had for about almost three years now. Uh, we're currently working with five professions, uh, about to start up with two more and then exploring other professions that can take advantage of this opportunity from DOD. So uh, you'll hear more from them in a second. We're excited to work with school psychologists. Um, there's a lot of talk uh, in Washington and state capitals now about uh, uh, behavioral health services. And so this is uh, another area that we can expand uh, the, uh, the reach and access to care for these services. We're currently working with the counseling profession, the social work profession, and psychologists. So uh, this fits right in well with, with uh, the compacts that are uh, operating, uh, trying to, to, uh, to become operational and in the stages of being developed. So. With that, uh, again, we're very excited to work with uh, this profession. Uh, appreciate everyone joining today. Hope you learn a lot. Uh, and then, you know, if you have any questions, you know, please uh, put them in the chat uh, and check out that progress uh, pro <laughs> pro project, sorry, website uh, that'll be up um, uh, that you can view our progress. And with that, Grant, I want to turn it back over to you. Uh, thanks, Dan. And, and as you mentioned, uh, this is a, we can, we can have this compact and this work because of our terrific partners at the Department of Defense through our cooperative agreement. Um, and we're going to include them on this project to give a little background on the basis for this cooperative agreement. Uh, we'll start off with Marcus Beauregard from the Defense State Li Liaison Office. Thank you, Grant. Um, I'll keep my comments brief because you've got some exciting people to talk uh, to you. Uh, they can give you a lot of information about compacts. Uh, we got involved with this uh, as a result of bringing the, the issue of spouse licensure to the states or to the uh, uh, professional staff members of the United States Senate and the Armed Services uh, Committee of the Senate. And they asked, what can we do to help? And I said that there's opportunities for uh, professions to engage in compacts, except that it takes funding, it takes resources to be able to accomplish this effort. And they saw the efficacy of this from the standpoint of not only the military spouses, but also the opportunity it presents with regards to all professions, all practitioners within a profession. And so uh, we've been very, very um, uh, excited about the results that we've seen thus far uh, with the five professions that have engaged uh, in the last uh, year to develop their compacts. And that has given us uh, great insight into where these, these efforts can go. And uh, it gives, I think, follow-on professions an opportunity to gain uh, experience in the in terms of writing these compacts from their predecessors. It, it's really an exciting process. Um, I want to be able to introduce Mr. Joe Ludovici, who uh, is our principal director. He's the number two that works for Mrs. Barron, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Military Community and Family Policy, who could not be with us today. And so I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Ludovici. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank CSG for the excellent uh, partnership we have uh, in our uh, cooperative agreement. Uh, but for that, we wouldn't be here today. And for all of you to participate, uh, DOD is happy to support this effort. As was mentioned, we have with other professions and occupations. Uh, the mission of my organization in particular is to take care of the needs of the military community. As you imagine, we move from state to state over a couple of years or from state to overseas. So ensuring military spouses in particular can maintain a career 
which involves moving uh, between states, is an important aspect of my responsibilities. We have a saying in the military, recruit the soldier, retain the family. Uh, having the military spouse feel like a full partner in the relationship can make the difference between a family staying or leaving the military. Uh, as Mark has noted, he's, he's told me about how compacts will work to support the military. Uh, and this particular one would also support our children as they move from state to state. And we have these uh, professional uh, psychologists that are there at the schools to support them. Uh, but not only, as Marcus noted, it's beyond military spouses, it's your profession that can benefit from it should you decide to move from state to state. So I look forward to hearing about your progress as your profession embarks on this journey. And thank you for your uh, participation. That's all I've got. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ludovici, uh, Mr. Beauregard, for your participation. We greatly appreciate appreciate all the help and resources provided by the Department Department of Defense on our program. and look forward to continued support. Um, and it, with that help of great resources, we also couldn't do this without some great technical expertise in the profession. And luckily, we have a great group from the National Association of School Psychologists um, who will help us along at every step of the way as we develop this compact. And it was uh, originally the application for this specific compact came in from, from NASP and uh, Dr. Eric Rosen. So uh, I'll hand it over to him to give a little background. They have a short few slides on why this is, you know, why this compact would be important for the profession. So Eric. Yeah, thanks so much, Grant. Um, so yeah, my name is Eric Rossen. I work at the National Association of School Psychologists. Uh, I want to start um, in a similar vein with thanking uh, everyone at CSG and the Department of Defense. Uh, Grant, Matt, uh, Daniel, you guys have just been um, incredibly supportive and helpful from when we first reached out and said, we want this compact, we want to play. Um, and uh, supporting us in developing that grant. And of course, we want to thank and acknowledge the Department of Defense for helping support such an effort. Uh, we've thought about this and wanted something like this and the fact that um, this resource is available to support the infrastructure and, and help us with both the funding and the human resources to guide us through this process is, is, uh, is just instrumental and I have no doubt we'll be successful due to that partnership. So truly thankful and thank you Marcus and Joseph for that introduction. Um, and so like any, any kind of grant application, when we received uh, the, the notification that we got it, it was, it was uh, all cheers. And then uh, 24 hours later, we said, okay, now we got to get to work. Uh, but we, I want to start by just kind of laying the context and groundwork for why we wanted to pursue um, a compact, an interstate compact. And so, you know, these numbers are not um, necessarily hard and fast. Uh, it's, it's difficult to capture some of these data, uh, but we have we estimate about 40,000 credentialed school psychologists in the USMS territories working in schools, working directly with students as practitioners. In some informal surveys, we uh, found that there was an estimated 7% are active duty military families, are from active mil uh, military families. And like uh, Joseph had mentioned, uh, you know, while, you know, while this compact is, uh, you know, can help the entire profession, it, it can significantly help those that are in, in needing to constantly be in transition and, and may not have the ability to predict which states they're going to. And one of the problems with that, of course, is that there's a lack of uniformity in state credentialing language. So many of us know Credentialing, the ability to earn certification or licensure and endorsements to work as a school psychologist is a state level enterprise. And so there is no kind of national oversight right now that says every state must follow this rule and these set of standards. And so NASP tries to create those standards and create a model for states to adopt, but states do their own thing and they have the ability to do so. What that means is that it makes it very difficult for someone to go from state to state if those standards are different. And even if the standards are the same and the requirements are the same, there are still processes that often can create delays in having that paperwork processed and reviewed. Even if you have the NCSP, uh, which is our national, nationally certified school psychologist credential, and another state accepts the NCSP, 
there are still processes in place that may slow down that process um, of getting that credential. And so it can, it can limit telehealth services as well, the ability to provide services to someone out of state, maybe on a temporary basis. Uh, and, so, and so really, uh, we know that there are a number of school psychologists from active doing, duty military families, but many others that are uh, hoping to provide services to others, maybe in nearby states, maybe across the border if you live near one, or having to move from state to state. And the delays in, in managing and processing that can limit access of services to students. And that's really our ultimate goal is to improve that, but also improve the experience for our school psychology professionals to provide those services. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Stacy for the next slide. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so Eric touched on this a little bit, but I just wanna emphasize that um, we know in school psychology right now that one of our biggest problems are the related to the shortage of school psychologists in different areas. And this compact, in addition to really improving the overall work experience and life experience for um, those school psychologists who are living and working um, in areas with um, as military families, you know, impacted by the military um, and the transitions. We also see a huge um, gift that comes from this in terms of being able to help deal with some of the shortages. As a former practitioner and um, trainer of rural school psychology uh, program out in Colorado, um, we saw all the time difficulties and complexities um, of service in rural areas. And one of the things that this compact would really do is open up um, the access out there. So where it doesn't necessarily increase the supply you know, at the core, what it does do is increase the access to school psychologists dramatically. Um, we saw this in a lot of times in areas where, um, like down in the Four Corners area in Southern Colorado, where you might have a school psychologist in close proximity to four, being able to serve in four different states. But because of the fact that they have to get licensure in all four of those different states, it was really a barrier. They basically have to pick one. When kids are in need, they really need to be able to access people and they need to be able to access pe uh, people quickly, especially in the events of crises that may occur. And that, um, you know, being able to have uh, a, an, an experience where if the states are part of a compact and somebody is uh, able to have a license associated with the compact, be able to serve in multiple states at one time, that um, is something that could really be helpful for kids. And we also know that um, with COVID especially, we saw the rise in telehealth services in our profession. And with telehealth, you have also the same complexity of where are you licensed and where can you serve? Uh, again, if states become part of the compact, join the compact, what you'll see is an ease of movement between those states and being able to serve kids in those states. Uh, this will also help uh, with a lot of recruitment, um, especially in hard to serve in rural areas um, where it's hard to attract people. A lot of times a barrier to moving to a different state than the state you were trained in is simply getting licensure. If your state is part of the compact, one of the things it'll do is actually increase the number of states that you can serve in and also open up for you the possibility of, of moving around a little bit um, or serving across border, things like that. So all of these these things we believe will be very important in helping to address the shortages in school psychologists and another great reason why we are so excited about this project and so grateful to CSG and to the Department of Defense for their support in making it happen. So I will pass it back to Eric again. Unmute yourself, Eric. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you. No uh, so thanks, Stace. Um, the a lot of times people have asked when we introduce the interstate compact is, well, what about the NCSP, our Nationally Certified School Psychologist Credential, which identifies individuals that have met a national standard. We have just under 18,000 NCSPs uh, at the moment. Uh, and so, you know, isn't, doesn't that serve as a form of reciprocity across states? Uh, well, the truth is that there really is not any kind of official reciprocity across states. So like I said before, uh, 34 states recognize the NCSP or acknowledge it in some way in their state credentialing regs. Uh, but even if you go from one state to another that recognizes the NCSP, 
Uh, there's still paperwork that's involved. In some states, there are additional exams that you need to take. They might be state level exams. There are some states that require you to take a, an exam on the state constitution, for example, or some other kind of um, evidence of competence or, or sharing transcripts or something like that. And so the NCSP certainly can help, uh, help us uh, think of a standard when, when we're designing the compact. Um, but the compact will actually go beyond the NCSP in many ways in achieving the goal of um, uh, easing portability um, and, and those that are moving from state to state or providing services via telehealth. So I'll turn it back over to, to Grant and the other speakers. Uh, and I think we might be going to Aaron as well um, and look forward to answering any questions you may have at the end. Thanks, thanks, Eric and uh, Stacy. We really appreciate that uh, presentation, kind of pointing out some of the significant issues uh, within the profession and how that can be solved uh, through an interstate compact. And then another way we can get a great perspective is we're fortunate to be joined by our guest, Erin Mahaffey. She's a licensed school psychologist and military spouse. So we've invited Erin to come on here and give us a little perspective um, from her, her point of view on how. Uh, what the benefits of this compact could be and some challenges that are faced from being in her position. So Aaron, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today with all of you. Um, so as Grant mentioned, my name is Aaron Mahaffey. I am a school psychologist. I am a member of NASP and I currently hold licensure in Arizona, North Carolina, Virginia, and I also have the nationally certified school psychologist credential that um, they just spoke about. Um, for a little background, I earned my master's in education in 2012 and my educational specialist degree in 2014 from the College of William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. I married my husband, who is an active duty Marine in 2012. And since being married, we have moved from Virginia to North Carolina, back to Virginia, then back to North Carolina, and we currently live in Arizona. So to put things in a perspective, my son lived in three houses before his third birthday due to military orders. Um, I have worked full time as a school psychologist in both North Carolina and Virginia, and currently in Arizona, I'm working part time. As a military spouse, I am so excited and also relieved that NASP has been awarded this grant from the Department of Defense and is working with the Council of State Governments to create this interstate compact. It's hopefully once it's all done, it's going to make life a lot easier. Uh, but in order to highlight the importance of this compact, I'd like to shed some light on how complicated it is for me to have these multiple licenses. I've compiled some of the information that I have to keep track of. And one important thing for you guys to know about school psychologists, if you don't already know, is that we love our data. So I have a lot of numbers for you. Uh, I was initially licensed in Virginia in 2014. That was a five-year license, which I renewed in 2019. My new Virginia license is valid for 10 years and will expire in 2029. My initial North Carolina license was also from 2014. I renewed that in 2019, and my new license is good for another five years and will expire in 2024. In June of 2021, when we moved to Arizona, I relicensed here. This license is good for 12 years and will expire in 2033. So already you can see the significant inconsistencies just in how long a license is valid for. Um, I have been a nationally certified school psychologist since 2014. I renewed in 2017 and in 2020, my current NCSB expires in 2023. So for anyone keeping track, I currently have four certifications or licenses, depending on what you wanna call it or what state you're in each with a different expiration date, 2023, 2024, 2029, and 2033. So if you think that was a lot of numbers, this is where it really gets to be fun. North Carolina requires 80 hours of professional development credits to renew a school psychologist license. 30 of those hours have to be specific to school psychology. 20 hours need to be in digital learning and 30 hours in general topics. The Virginia license now requires 270 professional development hours for renewal, and Arizona's renewal will require 180 hours of professional development. 
I should note that Arizona does honor out of state licensures and the NCSP and Arizona has been the easiest license for me to get because I've always maintained my other state licenses and that um, NCSP credential. Um, the NCSP credential also has renewal requirements, um, 75 hours for renewal. 10 of those hours have to come from a NASP or APA approved provider. Um, and they have to require, or they require three hours of ethical practice and three hours in equity diversion and inclusion. On top of keeping track of all of these hours and due dates for different states, each state also has requirements for child abuse and neglect training, emergency first aid, CPR, AED certification, dyslexia trainings, and other state-specific trainings. All of the above also require initial licensing fees as well as renewal fees. Those prices do vary state to state, and those fees could potentially be deterring some professionals from seeking a license with each move. For example, the NCSP renewal fee is $99 every year, and that's in addition to the annual membership fees I pay to NASP each year. Uh, I researched Virginia yesterday to see what their licensing fees are because all of these state fees do change often. Currently in Virginia, the initial licensing fee for an in-state applicant is $100 but an out-of-state applicant has to pay $150. Uh, and if you're seeking renewal in Virginia, that's $50. So maybe not everyone is deterred by the fees. Um, I have spoken to several military spouses about the frustration with the paperwork involved. With every move and attempt to find employment, we have to reprove ourselves by navigating a new state's procedures. Some have a Department of Education, while others prefer to be called the Department of Instruction. Some use the term license, others use the term certification. So you can see how it can get confusing just trying to relicense to work in a new state. Most states require that we provide official transcripts, redo fingerprinting and background checks, provide copies of our current license, even if it's not accepted for licensure, along with filling out their application. And some states even have testing requirements that would require studying, paying for, and taking another test to reprove your qualifications, even if you're an experienced school psychologist. So even if and when we do get our license and find new employment, then we get to restart the cycle of proof of employment forms, employee orientation, and restart proving ourselves to our colleagues. The cycle is never ending because military families are moving estimated about every three years. Um, to provide a little more perspective, I have been a school psychologist for eight years and I have licenses in three states. As a military spouse, this is considered easy. I'm fortunate to only have three states due to the fact that my husband's orders brought us back and forth from Virginia to North Carolina twice. If his orders had been different, it's very possible that I could have four or five state licenses at this point. So an interstate compact for school psychologists could not only make this complicated and inconsistent process from state to state easier for people who move frequently, but it might help address the national shortage that was spoken about a few minutes ago, just because it would be simplifying the process to relicense with each move. I know many military spouses, they might not be school psychologists, but teachers, nurses, whatever it might be, they just decide to take three years off because they don't want to redo all of the licensing and if they know they're going to be moving in two or three years. So this compact could potentially increase the likelihood of people seeking licensure and employment with each move, and it could eliminate hours of paperwork with navigating the procedures for initial state license, but also the time I spend tracking all of my professional development hours with each state's requirements. In addition to the paperwork eliminated, it could potentially save me hundreds or thousands of dollars in professional development that I'm constantly paying for to keep each of my licenses up to date. I have yet to let any of my licenses expire because my husband's career could bring us back to a state I'm currently licensed in. And thinking about having to restart that process is deflating. It's almost so deflating that I might not do it 
again, if I were to let a license expire to restart in a state we've been in. It's crazy to me to think that simply moving across state lines changes what some consider qualified in order to be a school psychologist, especially when I graduated from a NASP approved program. I've always maintained my nationally certified school psychologist credential and I hold multiple state licenses. If anything can be done to minimize the paperwork, decrease the fees, or just simplify the process of licensing between states for school psychologists, I am proud to advocate for that and be a voice for this cause because it could have a direct and positive impact on my career and I know numerous other school psychologists nationwide. It's, it's fantastic, testament, <laughs> Aaron. We greatly appreciate uh, greatly appreciate that and that perspective that you could give us um, on why Compact is needed. We know there might be uh, plenty of people out there that are asking, well, Compact sounds great, but what is a Compact? Uh, so we, we've developed a good over, overview of interstate compacts here at the at CSG um, that we, we're going to provide to all of you here today. So I'll hand it over to uh, Matt Schaefer, the Deputy Policy Director here at the Council of State Government. Thank you, Grant. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, like Grant said, my name is Matt Schaefer, Deputy Policy Director in CSG's National Center for Interstate Compacts. Um, like Grant said, we've had a great discussion so far about why this is needed, heard from um, uh, Aaron's story, which was an amazing case study in, in why this is so needed and so necessary. And, and so uh, now we're going to get a little bit into the specifics about well, what what is an interstate compact? What are we actually doing here with this? How do they work? What are some of the other professions that, that have these in place? Next slide, Grant. Okay, so uh, we already talked about CSG. I think we can just breeze over this slide, but we've been around for a long time. We've been working on compacts for a long time, really since our, our founding, and we work with all three branches of state government on uh, policy ideas and, and bringing state leaders together to learn from one another and to uh, foster innovative solutions, which we feel like interstate compacts uh, certainly tick the box there. Next slide. Okay, so in 2004, CSG formalized our work on interstate compacts by founding what we call the National Center for Interstate Compacts. And CSG has worked on the, uh, facilitated the development process of all of the active uh, interstate compacts for occupational licensing. But we've worked on a, a, a wide variety of other compacts as well. There's compacts out there um, about managing shared natural resources. If you're on the West Coast, you're probably familiar with the Colorado River Compact. Uh, so there, there's a wide variety of, of compacts out there that CSG has, has had our hand in, in helping develop. But in recent years, we've really seen an explosion of interest in using compacts for occupational licensing. Next slide. Okay, so what is an interstate compact exactly? Um, our definition, as you can see here on the screen, a legal legislatively enacted contract between two or more states. So this is a, a legally binding agreement that states enter into by passing a bill in the legislature. So that's how your state joins the compact is by passing the model legislation that basically says we're adhering to all these provisions that are, are in this compact and we are joining ourselves as a state to this agreement with all of the other states that have passed the compact. And so you can see a great example of uh, an interstate compact that usually resonates with people is the driver's license. So rather than the federal government saying, uh, all you states need to recognize each other's driver's licenses, the states came together and collaboratively developed the driver's license compact so that you, as a motor vehiclist can uh, hold one license in your primary state of residence and you can drive in any other uh, state in the country because of the driver's license compact that all the states are members of. So uh, these occupational licensing compacts function very similarly to this concept of a driver's license where you hold one state license 
And that punches your ticket to practice in other member states that are a part of the compact. So like kind of a 10,000 foot view, that's how all these occupational licensing compacts work. Next slide. Okay, so like I said, there's been a, a real explosion in interest in using interstate compacts for occupational licensing. You'll hear a lot of kind of myths and misconceptions about what interstate compacts do and don't do. At a, a at a baseline, when you we, you uh, uh, take away all of those those kind of misconceptions, all we are trying to do is facilitate an alternative process uh, by which somebody can practice in multiple states without having to get licensed there. So you hold one state license, you can practice in other uh, compact member states without having to get without having to navigate each state's licensing process like, like Aaron highlighted for us. So, and again, I would highlight this is an optional alternative pathway. We are not coming in and superseding the existing licensing process that exists in your state. That still remains. You can always go to uh, the North Carolina Board of Education and apply for your standard North Carolina School Psychology License. Uh, but this is just providing an additional optional pathway for somebody who wants to be mobile, somebody who wants to practice in multiple states or moves frequently uh, like our, our active duty military families. Um, we always point out that compacts help maintain or improve public health and safety. And so uh, this is largely because of a shared data system that's going to be developed alongside the compact. So all of these occupational licensing compacts, uh, kind of the backbone is a, a data system that houses information about licensees. So um, the, the member states will have access to discipline information, any ongoing investigations, adverse actions, licensing information uh, about people that are using the compact and that helps regulators make better public health and safety decisions. So we're really raising the bar of regulation and providing um, our regulators, our education boards, psychology boards with more information than they, than they currently have uh, the way the system is currently set up. Uh, and then lastly, preserving authority over professional licensing. So again, this gets back to the point of we are not overtaking uh, state licensing of, of school psychology. This is not a replacement of the current system, but it's just an alternative optional pathway. And I'll also point out here that compacts do not uh, touch scope of practice at all. So if there's significant scope of practice discrepancies between states, the compact is not here to address those and is not here to um, um, solve any of those those discrepancies and say, all right, you can do this in one state, but, but not this in, in another state. Wherever you're practicing, that's whose scope of practice you need to abide by. So if, if I'm licensed in my home state of Kentucky, I'm using the compact to um, uh, meet with a student in the state of Indiana across the river. Um, I have to abide by Indiana's laws and rules that govern school psychology while I'm seeing that, that student in Indiana. So wherever the practice is taking place, that's whose scope of practice governs that those services, that activity. So that's how compacts preserve authority over professional licensing. We're not coming into the state and dictating, this is what you have to do. This is what you have to define school psychology as. We're just creating an alternative pathway for, for licensees who want to work in multiple states. You can see at the bottom of the screen here just how popular these have been in recent years. Over 230 pieces of legislation just in the past six years and we'll see the list of, of nine active occupational licensing compacts on the next slide. Okay, so you can see the list here. These are our uh, the, the current professions that have these in place. Uh, you notice the ones on the left side of your screen have a little bit more membership. That's really just because they've been around longer. The Nurse Licensure Compact or the, the second iteration of the Nurse Licensure Compact was finalized in 2016. And really all of these other compacts have come since then. So, um, uh, nursing and, and medicine and physical therapy were kind of the first out of the gate. 
in uh, occupational therapy and, and counseling uh, the most recent just in the past two years. So these things take momentum to build a good number of states to, to get on board. But, uh, you know, once you've got a, a majority of states, the the results in the profession is is something that is lasting. So I, it's always important to emphasize that when people talk about, uh, you know, why does this take so long, or you know, why can't this be an easier process? You know, we're we're developing something for the profession that is is meant to last for decades, hopefully uh, long into the future. So this isn't. Uh, just kind of a, a piecemeal agreement to address uh, something in the short term, but this is something long term that we're uh, developing uh, for for the profession, and so they take time to develop, and they take time to get a good number of states on board. Next slide. Okay, so you can see here uh, kind of a heat map of where these things are most popular. I will give a shout out to Utah. Utah is the only state that has passed all nine of the active licensing compacts, uh, Georgia, Alabama, and Ohio closely behind with uh, with eight apiece. Uh, I think Maryland's up there with seven or eight as well. So there's a good number of states that have passed more than than six of these, six or more. Um, and, and so you can see kind of where, where these things are most popular. Interesting to note, um, there are some states that haven't passed any, namely uh, New York and California. I think Rhode Island and, and Massachusetts are, are on their way to joining a couple, they've they've both conducted um, studies in their legislature that had favorable results. So we're anticipating compacts will we'll start passing in those states. But New York and California have their own unique politics, and um, and so far up to this point, they've not really been very receptive uh, to these licensing compacts. Next slide. Okay, so here are the other professions that uh, CSG is working to develop uh, compacts for. So you can see here, uh, these are all being developed under that cooperative agreement with the Department of Defense that we've mentioned. Um, all of these except for the Physicians Associates uh, compact that's with a, a contract that CSG has with the Federation of State Medical Boards. So we're about to see a real explosion. There's nine active interstate compacts and, and that number is going to double in the next uh, two years and, and we're really going to see a lot of other professions coming on board. I think um, most importantly for this audience uh, would be uh, the, the teaching compact, which is currently drafted and is available for public comment and review. So if you're yeah. interested in in the teaching compact, I uh, would encourage you to uh, look at our website and, and check out our resources uh, around the, the teaching compact that we're currently developing. Next slide. Okay, so we get a lot of questions about how does this differ from uh, reciprocity or, or universal recognition? If you're, you're familiar with occupational licensing policy at all, you'll probably be familiar with um, universal recognition laws, which basically say that if you are moving from a state where you hold an active license, we'll just give you our, our equivalent license. And so uh, you can see here some of the differences. We think that... Uh, that uh, universal recognition makes sense for a lot of professions, but there, there are certain professions that have a heightened uh, public health and safety need. And we feel like interstate compacts are a better solution for, for those particular professions where you need a data system in place to ensure that states are communicating about um, a licensing across state lines. You need a, a system in place for conducting joint investigations and, uh, and joint discipline of, of licensees across state lines. And uh, oftentimes universal recognition doesn't get into the specifics about how the state is supposed to handle those discrepancies. And it's just kind of uh, a loose handshake agreement, which uh, certainly for some professions makes sense. But, you know, professions like school psychology that could, um, you know, do do a lot of damage potentially to clients and, and, and to students, vulnerable populations, we want to make sure that there's a, a robust uh, public health and safety, uh, safety net there for uh, the regulators. And so we feel like Interstate Compacts provides a better solution for, for those professions. Next slide. Okay, um, all this slide is, is really getting at is that each compact is crafted for the specific needs of the profession. So you can see here just a sample of, of some of the different licensing compacts and they all look different. 
the nursing compact utilizes what's called a multi-state license, which operates just like your driver's license, where you have one license and you can just automatically practice in all the member states. For the medical compact, there's an expedited licensure process where you're actually getting licensed in every state where you want to practice. So it's not so much states recognizing each other's licenses, but just an expedited process for you to get licensed there. Um, then the PT compact developed what we call a, a privilege to practice model where you receive a, a compact privilege in every state where you want to practice. So you don't need to remember all of those details. Just remember the fact that every compact is different. It is not the case that you can just take the nursing compact and delete the word nurse and insert the word school psychologist everywhere uh, that you, you see nurse. So they're all different. They're all developed collaboratively with the profession, with uh, the, the profession in mind so that we're meeting the unique needs of, of each profession. Next slide, please. Okay, so just uh, quickly to touch on the benefits, a lot of these have already been talked about, so we'll go through these quickly and then get to the Q&A portion. So obviously increased mobility is the primary benefit that we've been talking about here so far. Telepractice, a lot of people have mentioned teletherapy and, and this being a huge benefit to uh, being able to, to access not only uh, your border states for in-person practice, but um, states across the country where you could potentially, uh, you know, be seeing a, a, a student or a client anywhere um, that, that's a, in a state that's a part of the compact through technology. Uh, and then again, supporting our relocating military members and their families. I think we've we've certainly touched on that point quite a bit. Next slide. Okay, uh, benefits for licensing boards. These compacts help the profession come together on universal on uniform licensing requirements. Oftentimes, these are defined within the compact statute, and sometimes in a profession, you'll see movement from states to uh, more align their standards with what's in the compact. So. Um, you, you'll see in the counseling compact, for example, there's a requirement for a, a 45 hour uh, master's degree program in, in uh, counseling. And we've seen states who have a, a 60 hour requirement uh, come down to that, that 45 number because they want to be able to, to access the compact and, and allow their, their counselors to, to use the compact. And so you'll see that sometimes where states actually shift their standards a little bit to come into alignment with what's in the compact. We've talked about the shared data system. This is a huge benefit for regulators and really increases the amount of information that regulators have access to around um, discipline and investigations and any adverse action that's taken by, by other regulators. Uh, and then lastly, increasing access to highly qualified practitioners. So we've talked a lot about shortages and, and filling uh, shortage areas in states. And so compacts help uh, you to be able to recruit people to come into your state without having to navigate the licensing process. Next slide. Okay, and then lastly, benefits to states. Again, this is state policy. This is not federal policy. DOD is not writing this. This is not some sort of uh, uh, congressional bill, but these are states coming together to craft their own solution. So states are always going to be at the table and, and states are always going to be the, the driving uh, force behind what ends up in, in the compact. Uh, we've talked about how this strengthens state sovereignty. The state retains control over their licensing practices and over their practice act. Uh, so they, they retain control over professional licensing. This is just an additional alternative pathway. Um, enhancing cooperation between states. Uh, the, we've seen uh, compacts be used kind of as a forum for, for regulators to come together around uh, regulation in the profession and work together on joint investigations across state lines. And so it's really uh, helping the states work better together and, and be collaborative on uh, regulatory issues. Uh, strengthening labor markets, uh, like has been said, uh, states that have um, maybe a, a surplus of practitioners are able to, to send those, um, those licensees to states with their shortages. It, it creates an, an equilibrium in the profession around uh, uh, where uh, practitioners are, are locating. And, and uh, as a state, it, it helps you recruit highly qualified practitioners in, into your state, uh, as was mentioned on the previous slide. 
And then lastly, expanding the ability to protect public health and safety. This is the mandate of, of regulation is, is protecting public health and safety. And we feel like compacts um, are, are kind of the, the gold standard for allowing for mobility, allowing for um, multi-state practice while also maintaining a high bar for uh, regulation in public health and safety. Next slide. All right, uh, there's my contact information. Happy to follow up uh, with any specific questions, but we've got some time remaining in our meeting today. And so we want to get to all the questions from the audience about anything about compacts generally, about um, licensure for, for school psychology or um, about our, our process, how this is going to look over the next couple of years. Uh, feel free to, to ask any questions. The chat is, is open. You could also use the raise hand function and, and just um, ask your question verbally as well. So thank you all for your time and I look forward to your questions. Anybody would like to uh, just you can put your questions in the chat now or uh, you can ask them yourself using the raise hand function and we can call on you. I noticed there was a couple questions in the chat about, um, you know, is this uh, is this able to be passed in states already or, or do we have a, a compact that's that's ready for states and uh, because this is the, the kickoff meeting, this is really just the beginning of this process. So we're going to be working with NASP over the next uh, 12 to 18 months to develop the compact. There will be a robust public comment and stakeholder review process. So we would invite you all back to the table at that point to review uh, what we develop and give us your thoughts and feedback before the language is finalized. But we anticipate that the, the legislation will likely be available for the 2024 session, but probably not uh, sooner than that. And I would just add to that, um, we, are, we do have a, a plan in place to really work very closely with all of our state associations. Obviously, they'll be critical partners in making sure that all of this um, can be advanced. Uh, we do depend heavily on our you know, state school psychology associations to lead that legislative advocacy effort at the local level. And so um, any of you who are on the call who are school psychologists, it's a great time to go back um, and talk with your state, um, your states and uh, work with your leadership and start to, uh, you know, reach out to your contacts that are in your state legislatures uh, and so that you can start to lay the groundwork for this. Um, as Matt said, we really are hoping that, you know, by the legislative session of 2024, we will start to see um, some of this legislation hitting, you know, um, the state general assemblies. And so, you know, at that point, we really want to hit the ground running. So now's a good time to start building the groundwork that you need um, and enthusiasm for this type of project. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stacy. We'll move back. We got a request to uh, put up some of the contact information back up. Um, but then we, we also got a question in the chat um, from Alec asking about you know, if the state doesn't license this profession, can they can they participate in the compact? And then typically, Matt, you can kind of elaborate on this, but I, I know uh, compacts have specific requirements. One of those is the occupational licensure compacts we've had. One of those is that they do have to specifically license the profession um, and meet a certain specific requirements that they have of their practitioners that will vary between compacts and you know as we're going through the development phase we don't know what that looks like yet but um they will each state will have to meet those specific requirements to join the compact and i'm mad if you want to add to that yeah i, I would just say um that that is a, a fundamental component of all these licensing compacts is the the state has to license the profession and that's largely down to um, the fact that, you know, when talking about reciprocity and, and mutual recognition of another state license, you've got to be comparing apples to apples. You can't be um, comparing, you know, uh, two different things. And so if your state has something other than a license or um, or, or doesn't regulate at all, it's not it's not really a, 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 a fair comparison. And so. 
Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, if the state doesn't regulate school psychology, then they, they probably wouldn't be eligible to, to participate in the compact. Uh, and then another question from Maureen. Uh, if this is something the state association would be interested in creating, we'll have information and tools to be shared. Uh, you know, a part of our agreement is to develop uh, legislative materials to help uh, you know, legislators and to help local state associations to be able to advocate for their, for this compact and advocate for themselves um, that will create coordination with NASP um, and other members of the team. So um, that, that'll that be a great resource down the road once the compact's developed and uh, will help information for legislators and promotion that we work to develop. Yeah, and just as a follow-up to that, I, I think Maureen asked, uh, it sounds like this is a legislative item. Y yes, that that is, it's a, a legislative action for your state to join the compact. They have to pass the model compact legislation that we're going to be working to develop over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. And so the state associations are important in getting the, the legislation passed, but this isn't something that the, the state association could do by themselves. They would need to work with the legislature to get it passed. Absolutely. And, you know, just to, so thank you for those. Begin the groundwork. Uh, yeah, so Maureen, that's, that's really great. Yeah. Really great point. You know, just keep an eye out. I'd say on the website, we'll have a website up and keep in touch with, with us. You can you see contact information on the screen and then more information will be coming out as we go further down the process. Um, stay on top of our website. It's currently compacts.csg.org. Um, and so and thank you. Thank you for that question. We have any further questions? We got a little bit of time on here. If anyone has anything they'd like to add, well, if if not, uh, we appreciate everybody that came here today. Appreciate our speakers, NASP, uh, DOD, and Aaron, everyone for coming on today. We're looking forward to starting this process of developing an interstate compact for school psychologists. Um, and we appreciate such great interest in this already, and. Uh, Make sure to reach out to your, your friends, fellow professionals on uh, early ways to get involved and help out with the compact and stay in touch with us. So thank you all so much. We appreciate it.